Hello, everyone. My name is Tony Busby. I'm a lawyer here in Houston. I'm licensed in Texas and in New York. And I'll introduce other members of our team as they speak. As many of you know, our law firm has been at the forefront of some of the most important litigation in the United States. We like the tough cases. We thrive in the complicated cases. We've handled over the last 25 years some very big and very important cases. I believe that this one may surpass them all. There are many facets to this. The conduct we will describe today occurred over more than 20 years. There are many people and many entities involved. And we're gonna follow this evidence wherever it takes us. We will find the silent accomplices. We will expose the enablers who enable this conduct behind closed doors. We will pursue this matter, no matter who the evidence implicates. These brave victims who have stepped forward deserve nothing less. The biggest secret in the entertainment industry that really wasn't a secret at all has finally been revealed to the world. The wall of silence has now been broken and victims are coming forward. Our team has had at this point more than 3,285 individuals contact us with people claiming, people claiming to have been victimized by Sean Combs. After vetting, we now represent 120 individuals who intend to bring civil claims in civil court against Sean Diddy Combs as well as claims against many other individuals and entities that we will name as defendants as we file these individual cases. And you should know, to the extent the clients feel comfortable, we also intend to make these individuals available to the authorities, specifically to the FBI. And you should also know a few of them have already been spoken to by the FBI. Now before we discuss the nature of the claims and claimants themselves, let me comment on the large volume of calls we have received since our first announcement. Even before the indictment of Sean Combs, we had received a small volume of calls and it screened a handful of cases. After the indictment of Sean Combs and the announcement that we were pursuing these claims, the floodgates opened. People who wouldn't otherwise, for a variety of reasons, are now stepping forward to make their voices heard and to pursue justice. But no, most of these people are scared. They fear backlash in their communities. They fear backlash in their own families. They are afraid of retaliation from the perpetrators and their associates. They are rightly afraid for their own personal safety. I expect that through this process, many powerful people will be exposed. Many dirty secrets will be revealed. We know what we are potentially up against. And as is always the case in situations like this, when a celebrity is involved, people can be downright mean and nasty. You would be shocked at the length fans will go, no matter the evidence, to the contrary, to defend celebrities they love. I mean, there's a reason for this word fans. They're fanatics. I've personally already been threatened multiple times on social media, and when I agreed to pursue this, I expected as much. This isn't my first rodeo. But victims who step forward to have their voices heard should not be subjected to that kind of conduct. They should not be targeted. I want to say this, and I want to be clear about it. Although we are vetting each call as stringently as we can, I always start with a mindset that I believe victims. I believe victims because I understand the tremendous courage it takes to step forward. So if you're watching this, please hear me. If you're out there and you have been victimized, you are not alone. There is a great strength in numbers. You can seek redress. You can obtain justice. We can help you and we will help you. 
That being said, as stated, we are vetting every call that we receive. We've had to turn away some. For each, we ask for corroboration. For each, we ask for the identity of witnesses. We also have collected pictures, videos, texts. We check venues, we check dates. We want to corroborate that the claims being made have legitimacy and merit. We have on staff now a former detective from the Major Offenders Unit of Houston Police Department who is helping us vet each claim. We're using our common sense. We're being stringent because, as I said, these are not easy cases. They're very tough. The process is hard, and in some cases, the process is very lengthy. These cases are hard to prove. Many times, it's the victim's word against the alleged perpetrator. Each of these victims will no doubt be publicly attacked by the alleged perpetrators, and in some cases, the general public. The feckless and cowardly keyboard warriors love to attack. We know what we're up against. We did not enter this fray blindly. I wish it was my last such fray. I wish this type of hate behavior wasn't so pervasive. But it is what it is, so we will press on. As I said, our law firms have been retained by 120 individuals at this point to pursue cases in civil court against Sean Diddy Combs. You should know, in this group, it is evenly divided between males and females. There are 60 males and 60 females who have joined us to pursue these claims as plaintiffs. In this group, 62% identify as African American, 30% are white, and the remainder are Hispanic or Asian. The victims are from more than 25 states. The majority are from California, New York, Georgia, and Florida. I don't want to focus on the ages of these victims. When you talk about the ages of the victims when the conduct occurred, it's shocking. Our youngest victim at the time of the occurrence was nine years old. We have an individual who was 14 years old. We have one who was 15. 25 of the 120 individuals who are plaintiffs in these cases were minors at the time of the acts complained of. The time frame of the acts complained of is very wide. The conduct at issue spans from the years 1991 all the way till this year, 2024. If you wonder why there are so many alleged victims, that's your answer. We're talking about more than 25 years of this type of conduct. Now, although most of the victims who have stepped forward were victimized after 2015, this has been going on for a very long time. Now, when you think about the fact that some of this conduct occurred 25 years ago, and you wonder why would it take somebody so long to step forward. I want to remind you that, that many states in the United States have recognized that it's very difficult for a victim to step forward and to make these types of allegations when something very terrible has happened to them. I'll use New York, the state of New York, as an example. The state of New York has specific statutes in place that revive claims that are even claims that would typically be not able to be brought, that revive such claims and they can be brought even 25 to 30 years later. Because there's a recognition there in New York and California and other states that it's very difficult for a victim to come forward. And I would, I would respectfully suggest the only reason many of these people are coming forward because they see other victims coming forward. And it gives them some comfort that, hey, I won't be the only one. And I expect more victims will come forward. You know, there's an old saying that says, a lie has great speed, but truth has endurance. The acts complained of in these cases that we're going to file occurred primarily in New York, either Manhattan or the Hamptons, or occurred in California, primarily in Los Angeles, or in Florida, primarily in Miami. Most of these events and incidents occurred at parties, typically after parties, or album release parties, New Year's Eve parties, Fourth of July parties, something they call the puppy party, the all-white party, although several of these events occurred at auditions. Uh, many times, uh, especially young people, people wanting to break into the industry, were, were coerced into this type of conduct. 
uh, in the promise of being made a star or in the promise of, of having uh, Sean Combs listen to their tape or even let them read for Sean Combs. You should know that some of this behavior occurred at well-known venues in New York City. Some of this behavior occurred at private residences of people that we all know. Some of this behavior occurred at hotels that we're all familiar with. You should know that more than 55% of the victims filed reports, reported this conduct to either the authorities, that is the police, or to hospitals. We're in the process of collecting with our team assistance, uh, medical records, uh, reports that were made to the authorities, and I've already said that some of the individuals in this group did in fact talk to the FBI. You should know that, that several of the individuals, and when I say several, I mean many, uh, who did in fact seek medical treatment were drug tested, and drugs were found in their system, weird drugs, drugs that you probably never heard of. One in particular that, that continues to pop up is a drug called xylazine, or trank, which based on uh, our research is known as a horse tranquilizer. Now, there's been a lot of reports that we're filing a class action. This is not a class action. Class action is when one or two people file a case on behalf of a group of people. That's not this. These cases will be individual cases. Each case will live and die on its own merit. These cases will be filed individually, one plaintiff against whoever the defendants were involved in the case. Each case may be filed in one venue like California, another case may be filed in New York. One case may sue just Sean Combs, but multiple other people. One case may sue a range of people. I would expect most though to be filed, as I said, in New York and Los Angeles. Now I know this, many of you came here thinking or hoping or perhaps uh, believing that I may start naming names. Well, that day will come, but it won't be today. The day will come when we will name names other than Sean Combs, and there's a lot of names. Um, it's a long list already. And of course, I already know who some of these individuals are, but because of the nature of this case, we're going to make damn sure, damn sure that we're right before we do that. Uh, but the names that we're going to name, assuming that our investigators confirm and corroborate what we've been told are names that will shock you. These are individual cases. There are indeed other perpetrators involved. They will be revealed when that particular individual case is ready to be filed. They already know who they are. And I'm talking here about not just the cowardly but complicit bystanders. That is, those people that we know watched this behavior occur and did nothing. And I'm talking about the people that participated, encouraged it, egged it on. They know who they are. I call them the facilitators of foul play, willing participants in vile conduct. As we identify them, each will be part of this case as defendants. These defendants will not only include individuals, but will also include corporate entities who ultimately profited off of this culture and behavior. I'm looking at banks, pharmaceutical companies, hotels. We know that many of these individuals were paid cash. We know that, that many of these individuals involved, whether they were the ones being assaulted and abused or they're witnessing other people being assaulted and abused and then paid and threatened and told to leave. Typically paid 10 grand in cash and told to leave. And then threatened as they were leaving. So in addition to Sean Combs, you should know the defendants in these cases we're going to file will include anyone, of course, who engaged in the assault or exploitation, anyone who participated in such in any way, anyone who encouraged or facilitated this conduct, anyone who was in the room and watched it happen but made no effort to stop it, any venue or venue owner who was aware of what was going on but failed to stop it, any individual or entity who knew about the conduct and benefited from it but did nothing to report it or stop it, and any individual or entity who covered it up or helped cover it up. 
These people who know who they are should just come forward now. I would imagine, as we speak here, there are a myriad of people who are very nervous. You can't hide skeletons in the closet forever. I would expect there are many people out there right now who are, who are desperately searching their memories as they delete their text and data. Now, although these are, in fact, individual cases, there is a common theme, an MO, if you will. Typically, the victim is lured into a situation where he or she is given a drink. Typically, that drink reported by these victims is apparently laced with something. Once that drink takes effect, the perpetrators perform all kinds of sexual acts on the victims, many times passing him or her around as other people watch and enjoy the show and then leave the victim ashamed, confused, injured, and wondering what happened. When the victim reaches out, he or she is told not to say anything. Sometimes there are threats of all physical violence or financial repercussions or bodily harm. The claims we intend to bring will include the following. Violent sexual assault or rape, sexual abuse, facilitated sex with a controlled substance, false imprisonment, compelling prostitution, sexual misconduct, dissemination of video recordings, false imprisonment, sexual abuse of minors. Given the large volume of cases, and given our other docket obligations, and given the fact that we want to be sure when we file these cases that they are fully vetted, I expect we'll start filing these cases against Sean Combs and other perpetrators within the next 30 days. Now, it's rare, you know, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, uh, these types of, this type of activity is pervasive in our society, and it's rare we get a chance where, where uh, we can really focus on this as a country and really focus on this about how pervasive this is and what we can, as collectively can do about it. So I, I thought I'd take this opportunity before I go into some of the individual cases and talk about some of the individual claims being made and some of the so you'll get a, get a sense of what this 120 people group looks like individually. I want to bring forward uh, Carrie Paul. She's a national victim advocate uh, who uh, helps victims uh, who have been um, victimized uh, by this type of conduct. And she has some important words, and I hope you'll, you'll pay close attention. I think it's important that you hear from her. Hello, I'm Carrie Paul, the National Victim Advocate. It's not easy for any survivor to come forward. Our culture doesn't believe survivors. It blames and questions them. Instead of showing support, many choose to enable abusers. The media runs stories asking why it took so long for survivors to come forward instead of asking what barriers exist. We also don't equip law enforcement with the ability to handle sexual assault crime. Lack of funding translates to lack of training. We have officers in the field that don't know what to say to a rape victim and also an alarming amount of backlog untested rape kits. Prosecutors are, are focused on what they can prove in a case, and if so, how to do that at time of trial. Advocates and staff are stretched thin with growing caseloads in the criminal justice system. Most people don't know how the criminal justice works in general. There isn't enough staff or resources to adequately explain the entire process to every victim and survivor. Our culture works against victims and survivors every day, and abusers know this. Abusers work themselves into positions of power, building a public image that is trusted and financially large enough to make people look away. 
Abusers are unfortunately very skilled at power and control, the foundation of abuse. They seek victims who are vulnerable, such as children, their employees, and their intimate partners, all who see a different version than the public does, all who rely on the abuser in some way. And for those that do come forward and aren't believed, face questions like, are you sure it happened that way? Were you drinking? What were you wearing? All of this creates an environment that enables abusers to continue abusing them and future victims. To the survivors that have come forward despite not being believed at some point in time. Your courage is like nothing we have seen before. We thank you for coming forward for yourself and all survivors. And lastly, I want all survivors that are watching this to know we believe you and we support you. Thank you. I want you now to hear from my co-counsel, Andrew Van Arsdale. Uh, you know we've, we've created a sexual abuse hotline. Uh, I want him to visit with us just a few moments about how that works and the kind of volume of calls we've received. Thank you, Tony. Um, like Tony said, my name is Andrew Van Arsdale. I'm the managing partner of ABA Law Group. Uh, we have offices in uh, California, Montana, and North Carolina. Um, to build off of what you just so well said, it's very hard to come forward. And given what we've experienced the past 10 days, is really unprecedented in, in my career, at least. We represent thousands of survivors of abuse. And never, ever in a 10 day period have we seen over 3,000 people come forward where we've confirmed and decided to investigate and represent 120 people while we're continuing to work through another 100 plus cases to prove them up, to validate what has happened here and to hold those that are responsible accountable. And so like Tony said, we've set this up, 1-800-200-7474. I have a team of people standing by literally. If you know that this happened to someone and you have information about it, please contact us. If this happened to you, come forward. There's attorney-client privilege here. What you tell us is in confidence. Yes, we'll have to go out and build your case, but we will protect you. And the other thing that I wanna say is, the pattern and practice of this, again, it's unprecedented. Over 30 plus years of the same sort of events happening, people thrust into the circle reportedly and horrible things happening to them as a result. And from talking to these people that have come forward these past 10 days, I can tell you unequivocally that because the federal government did what it needed to do and indicted this man, that they put him in jail and a judge kept him in jail, they tell me directly, this validates my feelings. For so long, I thought it was my fault. What is it about me that put myself in that scenario? What was I wearing at the time? What did I do to be subjected to such horrific treatment at these people that I was trying to trust? But we know now it was not your fault. You were victimized by a group of powerful people that operated for 30 plus years, taking advantage of their wealth, and the power that they held within the music industry. So again, thank you to every single person that has come forward and contacted our office over the past 10 days. If you or someone you know suffered the same sort of treatment, please contact us at the number behind me and we will help you. Thank you. I think it, it speaks to how important this issue is uh, in the United States and frankly internationally that we have uh, 
reputable people here that want to provide the kind of information that I think victims need to hear, witnesses need to hear, the public needs to hear. Let me introduce to you now uh, Olivia Rivers from the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault and let her visit with you a few moments about uh, these types of cases. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Q Olivia Rivers. I am just served my um, sixth year as the board chair for the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. I'm also the CEO for the Bridge Over Troubled Waters, which is a local rape crisis center here in the Houston area. So thank you for being here as we address these heinous crimes. Sexual assault is not just a crime of violence against the body. It's an assault on the very essence of human dignity and safety. It shatters lives, it destroys confidence, and all too often, it leaves survivors feeling like they are voiceless, isolated, and vulnerable. The reality for many survivors is that coming forward to report their assault is one of the most difficult and daunting tasks that they will ever have to do. And for some, it may take days, months, or even years to speak up if they ever do. The reasons for this have been mentioned but include the fear of being disbelieved, being blamed or judged, and of course, retaliation. The trauma of the assault itself being compounded by the trauma of the criminal justice process where survivors must relive their experience in order to seek justice. And these feelings and fears are further exacerbated when the allegations are against prominent figures in the entertainment industry or Hollywood. Cases involving powerful figures often attract significant media attention, which can deter victims from coming forward due to fear of public exposure or scrutiny. The intense focus on these high profile cases can make survivors feel that their personal lives are being put under a microscope, causing further emotional distress. These allegations mentioned here today as reported reflect deeply troubling claims that deserve thorough investigation and no individual, regardless of their stature, is above the law or public accountability. Sadly, the statistics paint a very disturbing picture. According to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, one in three women and one in six men will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. In the US alone, there are approximately 463,000 victims of rape or sexual assault every year, and these numbers barely scratch the surface as sexual violence remains one of the most under-reported crimes. <clears throat> but the numbers that follow tell an even more troubling story. Only about 23% of sexual assaults are reported to law enforcement. Of those, just 5% lead to an arrest, and even fewer, less than 1% of reported cases ever result in a conviction, which is a devastating gap between the crime and the justice that survivors deserve. I want to briefly focus on our state here in Texas. Um, according to the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault, 6.3 million Texans, men and women, will experience some form of violence. That's every two minutes someone is sexually assaulted, meaning during the course of this press conference, around 60 individuals will forever be changed by this violence. And those are just a few of the victims. Obviously, this is unacceptable. We cannot allow this cycle of silence and inaction to continue. We have to create an environment where survivors feel empowered to come forward, where they are met with empathy and respect and support, not skepticism and blame. We have to ensure that our legal system is equipped to handle these cases with the seriousness they deserve and that survivors have access to the resources that they need beyond the legal courtroom. We have to address the root causes of this epidemic, prevention, awareness, and fostering environments where respect, consent, and safety are non-negotiable values. Additionally, support for survivors has to be holistic. They have to have access to counseling, medical services, legal advocacy, and of course, community support, regardless of whether they choose to report or not. To every survivor who has come forward, your bravery is an inspiration. To those who are still grappling with their decision, know that you are not alone and that your voice matters. Your story matters. We see you, we believe you, and we are committed to fighting for a future where sexual violence is no longer tolerated and where justice is not the exception, but the standard. Thank you. I wanna visit with you real quickly before we close here <clears throat> about some specific instances without disclosing the victim's name. Uh, you probably know that <clears throat> depending on the age of the victim, um, you can file these cases, these individual cases, uh, under Jane Doe or John Doe. Uh, each state is different in that respect. 
Uh, typically, there is a, a balancing test, like the public's right to know the name of the of the victim and plaintiff versus versus uh, the confidentiality and the safety of the plaintiff. So we'll have to struggle with that with each one of these cases. Our intention, of course, is to, like we always do, file these cases uh, under a pseudonym uh, until the court tells us otherwise. But let me let me share with you a few a few just kind of give you a sense of the kind of cases and the kind of instances that uh, people are calling and reporting that we are trying to corroborate, vet. Uh, and these are the ones that we've already corroborated, vetted, and collected evidence on. Um, one individual who was 22 years at the time um, she was assaulted said that uh, the, the typical MO at one of these parties that have been widely discussed um, in the press was that when, when you were handed a drink, and now we know that the drink is laced with something, if you refused to drink it, you were kicked out of the party. Now, let that sink in for a minute. I mean, the admission to this party was that you had to drink this, the chosen drink that was handed to you, uh, and now we know that, that in, in most cases, I would say 90% of the cases, uh, these individuals were drugged with some sort of drug. That, that was kind of the MO. Another instance, uh, this individual who was nine years old at the time uh, was uh, taken to an audition in New York City with Bad Boy Records. Uh, other boys were there to audition as well. All of them were trying to land a record deal. All of them were minors. Uh, this individual was sexually abused, allegedly, by Sean Combs and several other people at the studio uh, in the promise uh, to both his parents and uh, to him himself of getting a record deal. Um, another instance, another minor, uh, told allegedly by Sean Combs that he would make him a star but needed a visit with him in private about it away from uh, his parents. Once uh, they were in a private area, allegedly Mr. Combs made uh, the victim uh, perform oral sex upon him. Uh, another incident, uh, an individual 15 years old at the time flown uh, to New York City to attend a party, uh, was drugged and then taken into a private room, uh, allegedly in the presence of Mr. Combs, uh, where this uh, female individual minor was raped and then other individuals took turns raping her. Another individual, 26, at the time of the occurrence uh, was picked up by, allegedly, by Mr. Combs and several other people uh, in a black SUV from the airport, uh, was given one drink in the SUV and then literally woke up the next day not knowing what had happened, but with pain and damage to both her vagina and her anus, where she was then, she then went to the hospital. She was missing her underwear and her shoes. Another instance, an individual, uh, this time not a minor, uh, was attended a group dinner, allegedly with Sean Combs in Miami. Uh, she wasn't drinking because she was pregnant, uh, but she, whatever she drank at the table, apparently, at least according to her, was laced with something. She blacked out and she woke up in the same bed, again, allegedly, with Mr. Combs uh, in his uh, mansion in Miami. Her vagina and her anus were torn and sore. Um, and I could go on. I mean, literally, you, you, you're, you're sensing a theme here. It's, it's the same theme. Uh, and it all involves uh, some sort of drug. Um, one instance, an individual who was 20 years old at the time uh, was asked to attend, just saw her on the street, asked to attend a party in a hotel. Um, she was flattered, went to the party, was given one drink and doesn't remember anything else. Ultimately, uh, was so messed up, was, went to the hospital where they found um, cocaine and this horse tranquilizer in her blood system. I'm gonna give you a quote from a very young man uh, who told us over the phone about his experience and all the things that happened to him, uh, he says allegedly at the hands of Sean 
Diddy Combs and his friends uh, in the effort to try to sign uh, a record deal. Uh, this was kind of what he was told he would have to do. His quote is, had he not been in power, I feel like I could have been something great. I quit, I quit the industry because of what Sean Combs did to me. And that's really what it comes down to. We are pursuing this, asking you to support this effort, to encourage witnesses and victims to come forward and bring your evidence so we can continue to break down this wall of silence and we can continue uh, to have these stories heard. Um, this is the beginning of what I hope to be a national dialogue. This type of sexual assault, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation should never happen in the United, St the United States or anywhere else. This should have never been allowed to go on for so long. This conduct has created a mass of individuals who are injured, scared, and scarred. If you're one of those individuals, we ask you to reach out. If not to us, to someone you trust. If you're someone who witnessed any of these events, we ask you to reach out. Your name can remain confidential. With that, um, I'll take a few questions, not many, maybe two, uh, but if you have a question, I'll be pleased to try to answer it. Arthur. How many minors are making accusations in total, and are the feds aware of the allegations of minors in the case? I don't know what the feds are aware of, okay, but I do know it's 25 out of this 120. I will, I will say this to that point. Um, we welcome the FBI or any authority who wants to come to us, and we're going to make that available to these victims because I think that's important. Um, I, my, my suspicion is, based on uh, talking with these folks, is that, that you know the FBI is just not aware of these people. Uh, the FBI has talked to some of these folks, uh, and I'm going to try to make, encourage the victims uh, to, in fact, talk to the FBI because I think they have some very important things to say. And were all of the children auditioning because they were musicians, or were any of them uh, kids of employees or anything like that? All, all seeking either TV or some sort of music career with promises of, you know, we're going to make you a star. Instead, basically did things to them such that they don't want to have anything to do with the entertainment industry ever again. All right, guys. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to go now. Thank you.